So I was working on the red meat video that came out last week, and YouTube just kept suggesting more and more meat videos, because they know what we're thinking before we even know it. So creepy. This one said Oxford meat debate, so I was like, it's probably some Oxford professors lecturing about heme iron. Boy, was I wrong. It was actually a young woman named Michaela Peterson sharing a very tragic personal story and I gotta tell you, I was riveted from the beginning. She had a terrible case of autoimmune disease starting as a child and had to have several of her joints replaced. Uh, I was diagnosed with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis when I was seven, with symptoms starting when I was two. I had 37 affected joints. I lost my hip and my ankle. Very touching. She eventually found a relief by going on an extreme elimination diet. It sounds like she's eating nothing but red meat, salt, and water. So this struck me at multiple levels. First, at a general human level, I think anybody can empathize with a child going through a situation like that. Second, we have viewers with related issues who contact us and who are hungry for some answers. And third, I've had several family members, including my mother and a brother-in-law, who also had extreme intolerances with excruciating pain, reduction of quality of life, and had to go on radical elimination diets as well, so I've seen this happen before my very eyes. Just to clarify, we're not comparing situations. Obviously hers is very extreme going through this as a child. So we're not saying this one is the same as that one or better or worse. We're just trying to make sense of these extreme intolerances. And second, we all understand these are anecdotes. Michaela's, my mother's. We're not trying to derive some overarching scientific fact from these situations alone. We're just trying to get some ideas, discuss a topic and get some ideas as to what might be going on. Now, most people I've talked to would ideally like to see the situation solved and have the choice to eat whatever they want. That was the case with my family members and that seems to be the case with Michaela as well. I don't really wanna be on this diet, but I can't introduce anything without having my autoimmune symptoms come back. Sometimes it's the monotony, other times it's concerns about health or ethical dilemmas. And another element that I've heard consistently is an element of social condemnation, almost like feeling a finger pointed at you all the time and a sense of guilt. My absolutely absurd health experience uh, that's received widespread negative media attention. So to anybody in that position, I always say the same thing I told my mother back then. Don't feel bad, eat what you gotta eat to make the pain stop and have a decent life. There's no shame in that. And the second thing I told my mother was while you're doing that, we're gonna keep searching for answers. We're never going to stop. And we didn't. And we eventually were able to find them and reverse her condition, but it wasn't easy and it wasn't fast. And I've actually published a video several years ago detailing that process and I'll link it at the end. Now, I'm not for a second suggesting that everybody's situation is gonna be the same. Obviously, everyone's different. Some conditions can be reversed and some maybe cannot, but it's important to explore that possibility before we rule it out. So listening to Michaela's story at a scientific level, a couple of things occurred to me. One, pretty obvious, were there one or more food allergies involved? She says she had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and there are some suggestive links in the literature between food allergies and rheumatoid arthritis, including some in young patients. Another quick clarification, we're not trying to diagnose her. You don't diagnose people over the internet whom you've never met. It's not professional, it's not ethical. We're just thinking out loud. What are some issues that could be involved and where can we go next as we try to figure out uh, this issue in general? I also wondered if there's a gastrointestinal condition at the root. She did mention she had many health issues, but I don't know if there were any gastrointestinal symptoms. But ulcerative colitis, for example, which is a form of inflammatory bowel, is often linked to rheumatoid arthritis. And one of the therapeutic approaches to some of these gastrointestinal conditions is something called a low FODMAP diet, which is a diet that restricts several types of fiber. So it's reminiscent of the improvement she reports experiencing on her low fiber elimination diet. Now, maybe her doctors already ruled out all of these possibilities, or maybe not. This is just to illustrate the general process that we actually applied to my mother's case. Initially, her condition was a complete mystery to us. And we just kept digging into the literature. We wanted to know everything that was known in this field that was relevant to her situation. And we kept knocking on doors and talking to specialists after specialists until we had some answers. We actually have a whole video coming on how to do your own research that covers the tools and the mindsets and this whole process in general for anyone who's interested in replicating it. The idea, of course, is to identify the root cause to get a proper diagnosis 
so that you can then intervene at that level if that's possible. So that's what ended up turning my mother's situation around. Now, the tragic thing is a lot of times people who have been through a lot and haven't really gotten any substantial help from the medical system sometimes give up on doctors and medicine altogether. And I can't blame them. I tried going the medical route uh, and it didn't work. It was very frustrating and very exhausting for us too. We just kept seeing doctor after doctor in that field. And initially we couldn't get any answers other than, okay, so you just avoid all of those foods that you can't tolerate for the rest of your life. Bye. And they weren't trying to milk us for money or holding back knowledge, nothing like that. They told us what they knew. It just wasn't much. So we had to keep searching for answers. And eventually the solutions we found were scientific. They were things that had been published and professionals that dealt with these issues routinely. Unfortunately, the more atypical your case, the more you'll have to search because they're the professionals who have experience in that area will be less common. What I can tell you is seeing my mother now much healthier with a more diverse diet, happier. It was all worth it a million times. In our case, the key was reintroduction, which is something I wondered about regarding Michaela's case as well. So with low FODMAP diets, there's an initial phase of elimination of simplification of the diet. And then there's a subsequent phase of reintroduction. Now this is very counterintuitive. And a lot of people balk at the suggestion of reintroducing foods that cause symptoms, but this is actually a pillar of the approach, particularly with some of these gastrointestinal conditions, even things that we find pretty scary and categorical, like peanut allergies in kids, for example, which the default approach is just keep the peanuts away from my kid indefinitely. And yet this new trial just came out where they took allergic kids, peanut allergies, and they exposed them to specific doses of peanut protein. And that might sound crazy because it's counterintuitive, but they were able to greatly improve the allergies. And in some cases, the kids even overcame them completely. So reintroduction when done right can desensitize the immune system in some cases, and it can rebuild the ability of the gut to digest some of these problem foods. So that's exactly what happened to my mother. In her case, it was IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, and she had a strong intolerance to pretty much all legumes, whole grains, and most fruits and vegetables. So she went on a type of low FODMAP diet, not quite as extreme as Michaela's, but in that general direction. And then we went into the reintroduction phase very carefully and very gradually. First, things like white rice and white potatoes, because they're easier to digest. Then the whole grains, always very small amounts at first. Third step was legumes. And then finally, the rest of the fruits and vegetables. Sometimes it would cause a flare up and we would take a step back and then slowly move forward again. And there was significant hesitation and fear on her part, understandably. I can't begin to describe the level of terror of having diseases return. But eventually the floodgates open and she did almost a 180 between phase three and four, between the legumes and the rest of the fruits and vegetables. And almost it seemed like overnight she could eat whatever and feel fine. Beans, lentils, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. It was really quite something to watch. But if this process is done randomly or too abruptly, or if there's an underlying issue that needs to be addressed first, then reintroduction can cause symptoms, can cause an episode. So the how is pretty crucial. Now, Michaela does say that she tried to reintroduce some foods and had symptoms. And I've tried to reintroduce plant foods. Which is not that surprising. So I wonder about the details of how this was done. Ideally, if people have that option, this is done under the supervision of an experienced professional, like a, a registered dietitian with experience in this area. And of course, there's always a theoretical possibility that there's an irreversible condition but we get there by exclusion. It's not the default conclusion, right? Now, the second part of her speech was very interesting because after sharing that very touching personal story, she went on to list um, some common ideas, things like saturated fat doesn't cause cardiovascular disease, nutrition is all epidemiology, fiber is not that important. These are very common misunderstandings and we've addressed them in previous videos, but this time it was different. It felt different for me. Because this wasn't a scientist trying to make those points on a scientific basis, and because I had just come from watching her personal story and felt empathy towards her, I didn't judge those points scientifically. I wasn't in science mode, right? So I was able to feel where she was coming from emotionally and kind of get a sense of why these beliefs are so compelling to many people and why they embrace and defend them so fiercely. I think there's an element of self-image and peace of mind about believing these things much more than 
you know, what studies or what data is out there. In fact, it would feel out of place to do what we normally do in these videos and start fact-checking those statements with, with a bunch of data, right? It would feel like it's the wrong tone. Her speech is not about those bullet points. It's about her personal story. It doesn't behoove her. It's not her responsibility to know what data is, exists or not, or what meta-analyses were done or were not done. I mean, medicine is about both the evidence and the person sitting in front of us. So I thought it was very refreshing to see things almost through her eyes, to almost feel why this worldview can be so important, especially in her situation. Now, amazingly, it sounds like she changed her entire speech right before the event. I rewrote my entire speech an hour ago. To include her personal story, which I think was a phenomenal move, because as it turns out, this speech was part of a debate on whether we should move beyond meat, on whether humans as a whole should stop consuming and stop producing meat. And the second part of her speech with the bullet points is not compelling scientifically or personally, but the first part with the personal story, in my opinion, settles the debate. How can we tell somebody in her position who's gone through what she's gone through that she has to stop doing the only thing she's found, at least so far, that made the pain stop? It would be insensitive, it would be absurd, and she's not going to listen. And quite frankly, why should she? When we're in pain, we want the pain to stop. We don't want rhetoric or bar graphs. If we can offer some real solutions and reverse the intolerances and fix the underlying issues, like we were very fortunate to do with my family members, most people will take that. But if we can't, if we don't have something better to offer, they're going to avoid the foods that cause pain, and they're going to fight anybody who tries to stop them. And that's entirely understandable. So guilt tripping someone in that position is a waste of time, and quite frankly, it's cruel. It's inhumane. With meat, there's usually three aspects that come up. Health, environment, and ethics. And I don't think any of the three apply to her situation. And I'll tell you why. Health is about risk-benefit, as we talked about last week. What she's doing is clearly preferable to where she was before. Any concerns about long-term cardiovascular risk, risk of cancer, are completely superseded by the devastating issues she was already having, having joints replaced as a child. So until there's a real solution to the underlying problem, this is all she's got. Now, the challenge in science is to find a model that explains all our observations, not just a shred of evidence. So telling her that she needs to go eat a salad because of this study or because it's healthy for most people is not medicine. If she's tried that and if it gives her debilitating symptoms, telling her that she needs to go do it anyway is divorced from reality. By the same token, we don't want to be glib and extrapolate from this case and my mother's case and other cases that, oh, I guess vegetables are unhealthy for humans and we should all ditch them. That's not science either. We want to reach understanding without ignoring people's individual circumstances or scientific knowledge as a whole. That's medicine. Second, the ethics. I see no ethical problem with what she's doing. Feel free to disagree below. Um, it's her immediate well-being and life on the line. And third, environment. We know from a lot of research, interestingly, some research out of Oxford University where she's speaking, that we can't solve the climate problem without changing our food system. And unfortunately, red meat is the number one offender with just a disproportionate carbon footprint. But this works at a global scale. We need to cut back as a team. The pressure is not on her to cut back. It's on me. I'm incredibly fortunate. No matter what I eat, I feel the same. Short and medium term, at least, different points of my life, I've eaten more animal products and less, more processed food and less. I feel the same regardless. So it's on me to do the heavy lifting, to do a little bit extra, to consume and pollute less through my choices so that people who can't choose can eat whatever she needs to have a decent life. I think this is obvious. And I'm very hopeful that lab-grown meats will be scaled up and become a part of the solution soon without the environmental and ethical issues. That would be a godsend. And like I told my mother, we will never stop searching for answers. I actually had some gastrointestinal specialists lined up last year, but uh, due to our family health crisis, which a lot of you guys are familiar with, we had to power down the entire channel and cancel all of that. But now that things are much better, much more under control, I'm going to have those people on very soon, and we're going to try to have some answers and some clarity. All right? These are not the easiest topics in the world to broach. There's a lot of emotion, but fighting is not going to take us anywhere. We have to shoot for some scientific understanding and some real solutions. All right? So let me know your thoughts below. Take care. See you next time. Bye.